Boom. All right, welcome everyone back. Um, David Perkinson is working at uh, Reed College. Reed was also another uh, utmost test site. We'll let David take it from there. All right. Uh, well, first of all, thanks to the organizers for all their hard work. It's much appreciated. Oh, and second, you might, Rob brought this up, look at the format here. This is, this is called handwriting. <laughs> it has this. Does the cloud support this? Do you need this oh, good old journal. It has this advantage that it's, it's like, it's pretty hard to export this. It's got very little structure. <laughs> so people know that it's created especially for them when they, they see it. <laughs> Right, so we were uh, a test site, Reed was a utmost test site, and I, so I thought I would just give a couple of ex explicit examples of how we were using Sage in the classroom, or actually I'll say how I was using it in a couple of my classes, and particularly these two classes. Um, last fall I, I taught a multivariable calculus course. We had to have a year-long sequence of multivariable calculus. So I'll talk about, say, Math 211, the first part, which is just differential calculus. Then I'll tell you about this geometry course. Okay, so Math 211. Well, I can just show you the, here's the home page, and you can see what we did during the first week. I guess that's big enough. And you can see, actually, the, the first day I start off with a, um, an example here that's supposed to illustrate kind of the main point of differential calculus. So this is, I have a mapping from R2 to R2. And here's a grid in the domain, and then this is the image in the codomain here. And the point is that when you make this grid smaller, or shrink it down, as you shrink the grid down, <coughs> the this middle of this grid is the point one quarter, three comma three quarters. And then as you shrink this down, um, well, there's a little button for magnify. Of course, it gets really tiny too. But if you magnify it, then you can see that it's becoming. Uh, linear, and then we compute the you know the the kind of the limit there. That's <laughs> cool. So it's yeah, you really get to appreciate on the first day what the the subject is about, and then starting that first week. Basically, the way I would incorporate reading the classroom is I would well I would use it in class to give demonstrations, and then I would have a a homework problem each week. That involved uh, a sage exercise. Well, not well, just a computer exercise. So the very first, at the end of the first week, what they were supposed to turn in was give me a picture of a parametrized surface with a tangent plane attached to it. And the second week's more typical, where they have some ordinary kind of problems. And then there was a problem here: give me a, a picture of a parametrized curve in three space, but at every point in the curve, attach its tangent plane. So you get the surface called the osculating developable. It's algebraic geometry people like, and so on. So I can show you like this is this would be what I was looking for with that first problem, something like that. And for the second problem, something like this here is a, a curve with its tangent planes attached. But the things I was getting, I can show you some examples. These are kind of random examples from students and kind of typical. So of course the students wow. will you can see the blue curve in there. And then all the tangent planes are attached to it. And they got really into things, especially the colors, some of the more esoteric colors they were becoming experts at. Um, oops, I forgot to excise this person's name, but she uh, turned in. This, this was a later assignment where I, I up the bar kind of, and so this is a parametrized surface with its tangent planes, but you can see these two curves on the red and yellow curves. Those are images of curves that are parallel to the coordinate axes back in the domain. And these are the velocity vectors. So this is like picturing the two columns of the Jacobian matrix. You can see those two arrows there. And I kept a, a kind of gallery of the nicer ones when I put it on the website. So people, I think that motivates some people to, <laughs> to try to do more interesting things. This, of course, is like a typical thing you would do if you were talking about, um, oh, here I can illustrate awkwardness of that. Okay, uh, so if you're talking about a real valued function, one assignment was, okay, just make up a function and then give me a contour plot and attach the gradient vector field. Oh, you can see perpendicular. Yeah. <laughs> so that was kind of the point of that. And no, that's, that's pretty much sums up what we, we did. I had a, 
uh, an account on the Sage MB, the read one, uh, for the class, and I would have these, my examples on there, and then also you can see it, I've got, like, there's a, there's a worksheet, so they could, if they wanted, if they wanted to, they could download that and look at them. Which calculus class was this again? This was a multivariable calculus so class, a sophomore class. Really. Sophomore multivariable calculus. Yeah. Yeah. There's some issues. I, I think this issue of how you collect homework, it would be, if people are interested in talking about that, I would like to get together with them and maybe we can just start shooting around ideas and maybe come up with something nice. What I did was... That's a question that came up a lot in the prep workshop that we ran the last three or three summers yeah, as well. No, you know, nobody really has an answer. And I don't even know what people do with things like mathematics or anything. Let's set up a discussion time. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah. About. This cloud thing probably is something we can do. Yep. I just set up a Gmail account for the class, and they would send all of their stuff there, and I would sort through it. I didn't require them to use Sage. I just said, you know, this is a computer thing. This is early enough that the physics majors were not indoctrinated, most of them, into uh, Mathematica yet. So most people sent me Sage stuff. <coughs> it's easy to grade if they do it right, because, you know, they send you a picture, and if the, the tangent plane is sitting where that's great, but you know sometimes they send a picture with the tangent plane like transversely <laughs> cutting or <laughs> plane sitting out in space. And <laughs> I'm thinking, really? Maybe I didn't communicate something exactly. The, the partial credit problem is difficult because you have to think pretty hard about what it is they've done wrong. Or yeah, that's well, right. And like then do resubmissions, so they have to keep yeah. doing it until you get right. That's what I would do. I would write the yeah. email, and then they would send me stuff. Right. So it's a. It, Bit time consuming, and you have to click around a lot, of course, and that's kind How of many annoying. Were in the class? How many people were in the class yeah. in this one? I can't tell you exactly, but it'd be around 20, I think. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's that. Now, the this would, there's a junior level class. It's a topic, the Math 341. It's a topics course in geometry, and I'd gotten interested uh, through my research in hyperplane arrangements and I was looking for an opportunity to kind of systematically learn this subject. And well, here it was. So I used this course. And um, we used these really nice notes by Richard Stanley. They were here right on his web page on hyperplane arrangements. It's free. You can just download it. Um, it says it's for graduate students, which is a bit daunting. Uh, because the prerequisite for this course was just linear algebra. But, um, you know, I was there to make it accessible to people, and I didn't feel like we had to cover everything. Um, it's a little advertisement for this subject of hyperplane arrangements, and uh, just to put it, everything in context, I'm going to show you some sage stuff in just a second. I've got five slides here where I'll show you the first theorem that we proved in this hyperplanes class. So what's a hyperplane arrangement? Well, it's a collection of hyperplanes in space. It could be an RN or CN, or it could be over a finite field. Here, you can see I've got five hyperplanes in R2. Those five lines in R2, that's a hyperplane arrangement. So that was the object of study for us. I thought it qualified as geometry. <laughs> but it's coming from Richard Stanley's point of view, so it's a, lots of combinatorics. So, Here's a combinatorial thing you can attach to a hyperplane arrangement. It's this intersection post set. So you look at all possible intersections of these hyperplanes, uh, and you order by reverse inclusion. So the kind of the empty intersection would be all of R2, in which they sit. These 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, those are the hyperplanes, these lines themselves. And on top, you have the intersections. Like 1, 3 here is the intersection of hyperplane 1 and hyperplane 3. 1, 2, 5 is special, that's even because, because these hyperplanes 1, 2, and 5 all intersect in the same place. So that's a partially ordered set. That's slide 2. I've got, I think, five slides. Then the next thing you need is the Mobius function, which I'm going to illustrate here. The way it works is you put a, so here's that post set I had on the previous page. But I'm going to assign numbers to each of these spaces, and that'll be the Mobius function. Where these hyperplanes sat, I put minus ones. And if I do that, then you'll notice something that if I take a hyperplane and I look at everything smaller than it, there's only one thing at this level. 
and I add up these numbers, I get zero. So that's kind of the defining thing about the Mobius function. You can do this kind of recursively. Up here, if I put a one there because, well, but I, the idea here is if you look at everything below here, which is just these guys, and you add up all of those numbers, you get to zero. So that's the rule. So I get a one, 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 one. And here, this one's a little different because there are three things there, one thing. So those, this is all, these are all the things that are below this. Should it be a two? So it should be two. Okay. All right. So given the hyperplane arrangement, you make this intersection post set, and then you can create the Mobius function. And then the, the next step, the penultimate slide here for this is uh, this, you create this thing called the characteristic polynomial. So what you do is you add up the rows. So I get these numbers 8, minus 5, 1, and you put them in front as coefficients in a polynomial. That's the characteristic polynomial. And the cool theorem is, well, whenever you have a hyperplane arrangement, uh, these hyperplanes dice up space into these regions. Right here, you can, I'm putting dots in each of the regions right now. If you take the characteristic polynomial and you evaluate it at special points, you can figure out what, how many regions there are. So here, at minus 1, you get 14. There are 14 regions there. And four of them are bounded, these four guys. So that's a cool theorem. OK, so um, how does the class work? I thought I had the page open up here. Maybe it's a little bit yes. OK, so here's the home page for the class. And you see, it took us a week to get to the characteristic polynomial. It only, here, we only took you know, three minutes. But starting in week two, I, started, uh, I would have sage assignments. And we used it for experimenting a lot. But like, this third problem here was, say, take this thing called the braid arrangement uh, with this parameter 4. So this is actually a four-dimensional thing. But it's essentially a three-dimensional thing in a way you'll see in a second. And even better than that, it's, it's kind of symmetric with respect to the origin. So you can intersect it with a sphere and actually see it on a sphere. So it's kind of a two-dimensional thing. And so I, the problem was, show me that picture, which was kind of a, a non-trivial linear algebra problem for them. And that cool thing about this class, I have to say, actually, of all the classes I've taught in like 20 or 25 years, however long it's been, this might be my favorite class ever. How many students were there in the class? There were about 12. I had no idea how it was going to go because I was hacking this class together the night before. I was learning the material and then presenting it in class. And um, yeah, I'll tell you about the Sage stuff in a second. I was hacking that together too. But what happened in this class is eventually, uh, pretty early on, I started thinking about questions that were interesting to me and posing them as homework problems. <laughs> <laughs> and then we so talk about the homework problems, and then everyone was surprised that no one could figure it out, including me. And, but it, somehow the atmosphere was just right, and everyone just really got into it. Um, <laughs> not necessarily. It was just something. I, I felt like something just happened to click. They do that at Williams, I'm sure, too. <laughs> something just happened in this class. And then, uh, what was this? This was in week seven. We started proving new things. Like, I don't think, I think that's a new formula, and I think it's kind of elegant for a, a characteristic polynomial of a certain. Uh, well-known uh, hyperplane arrangement. Okay, I had an ulterior motive to this class besides the, the primary ulterior motive, which was that for me to kind of systematically learn this stuff. Oh yeah, here's an example, by the way, of a problem that we never did figure out. You know, it's not this, it's not important exactly what it, what it is, but we did make some progress. But my other ulterior motive was this thing called the G C conjecture. I'm not going to say what the GC conjecture is, but it was a problem I was thinking about for a couple years. The year, uh, let's see, the year before last, I was on sabbatical, and I spent a good 
portion of my sabbatical thinking about this problem. Um, Art Duvall was the one encouraging some of us to work on it, and I got to work with Carly Clemens a bit during my sabbatical on this problem. And I didn't figure it out, um, but what I, I told my class that, well, at a certain point, I just decided to tell them everything I knew about the problem. Actually, starting here is when I started to do that. And I spelled it all out. And during my sabbatical, I did have this one idea that I thought was significant. It was a certain kind of topological idea, kind of a Stokes theorem kind of idea. And when I presented that to the class, uh, one of the students there, uh, Sam Hopkins is his name, he said, he got very excited and said, well, if, if you know that, I'm sure we can solve this problem. Yeah. And I wasn't really quite sure if it was, at that point, whether the conjecture was true or false. But sure enough, over the next week, Sam just cranked out the solution and had what I thought was a really ingenious idea. Um, I mean, he had to explain it to me more than once after he had written it up. And um, let's see, by week, here's week 12. I think I, I was out of town for some reason this, uh, for this class, but Sam just presented the proof of the, the conjecture. Actually, he said a more general thing that we proved. And he presented the proof on that day. And that turned into this. I told Sam that it would be a good idea for us to write this stuff up. And I, was, and I kind of outlined how it might go. And I was thinking, OK, maybe next semester or during the summer we'd write it up. But pretty much within the next couple days, he had already written the paper. And he's like, like a fluent writer in mathematics, a, a better writer than I am. So that was just amazingly nice. And so Sam's off to graduate school next year, but I'm still we're still working on projects together. Okay, uh, so now I, I wanted to quickly present some of the. So I was hacking the you know the actual material, I was putting the class together, but I was also writing this Sage stuff. My idea was to take everything in Stanley's notes, and then as we did in class, I would implement it in Sage. So, for example, um, oops. here's that first hyperplane arrangement that I was talking about earlier. Um, well, you can see the input up here. These the hyperplanes are just inputted. You, you write them out in a kind of a straightforward way. And there are several classes I had to implement. So there's a hyperplane arrangement class. There's a hyperplane class. I also found I, I needed an affine space, like an affine subspace of a vector space. I didn't see that already implemented in Sage. But I would love to talk to anyone who has ideas along those lines. Here is the characteristic poly Oh, well, first of all, you can see most of the methods I have uh, for this. Right here. Well, okay, that's that's everything. It's a short list right now. These are all the methods for a hyperplane arrangement. Here's the characteristic polynomial, which is what we had before. Um, you can get the intersection post set. <coughs> Arranged a little bit differently. Um, I implemented some standard <coughs> hyperplane arrangements. I tried to do it in the same way that it's in the, the graph, like the way you use graphs in Sage. So the hyperplane arrangements, and here's a, a class of arrangements called semi-order arrangements. Here's a picture of one of those where the parameter is three. So it's a three-dimensional thing. You'll notice this is kind of special because all the hyperplanes are parallel to a certain vector. So this is uh, what's called uh, it's not essential, but so you can ascent, you can find the essential the essentialization of this is you slice this hyperplane arrangement along here, and then you get a, a hyperplane arrangement in two dimensions. So here's a picture of that, and you can see that it's not done in the best possible way. I think. Uh, or did I say show? I did say show. So these are commands that you've written. They're not standard part of Sage. These things, yeah. 
Or he's going to open a ticket for poster. Yeah. Oh. Yes. <laughs> Submit a patch. Oh, here it's it is showing up. Oh, so you can see this is not perfect. That's not you know the ideal thing that you would want. And then this is, I'll do one other example and quit here. So here is the same class of hyperplane arrangements, but one dimension up. So this is a four dimensional. So it's twelve hyperplanes in four space. So hyperplane. Arrangement. So some students that I have working with me this summer are they're helping me think about this code and then also we're starting to actually document it. This gives a definition of the semi-order arrangement. It's not important for us right now. I'll just though uh, it is a it's a four-dimensional thing, so I could say a dot show. And it doesn't do anything. <laughs> that goes right to the 4D printer. It's being printed out. <laughs> <laughs> <we're> speaking. I <laughs> mean, <laughs> yes. Wow. Um, oh, okay. Well, there it's, I listed all the hyperplanes, and it has 183 regions. So it's slicing up four space into those regions. Is it essential? No. So we can slice it, and that actually puts it in three dimensions so we can actually see it. That visualization suffers from the same problem of being a little bit warped. The projection is not the one one would really want. So, you know, this could all be improved. So there are 183 regions in three space. So it's a bunch of polyhedra in three space. You can ask Sage to figure out what all those regions are, or you could ask for, like, your favorite region. So inside that hyperplane arrangement, there's one in the center that contains the point, the origin, and that one looks like, there's like the that. Over on it. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, it's very cool. Thank you very much for the person I met yesterday who implemented polyhedra in Sage. Wow. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so that's all I wanted to say. Oh, yeah. You mean if I did hyperplanes? Yeah. No, we're finding fields. Yeah, that's not really done. Oh, it is done in combinatorics, right? Yeah. Yeah. There's this finite method, it's called, or whatever, right? The more interesting cases of the complex field. Yeah, that that, that's, that's the one that people act with. Well, common Turks people and like Green League groups people and Coxeter arrangement people, they're interested actually the reels too. But I know that the real hardcore hyperplane people, they are interested in like the homology of this, you know, the space once when you're working in CN. So one thing I would like to implement is this or like Solomon ring. Uh, yeah. But that's common so you can do it. Yeah, that's right. It's totally cool. Yeah. So I would like to talk to you about that. I am a novice at this. Other questions? Okay, thank you.